So needless, needless weight in our lives, which unforgiveness actually is, uh, if we had real weight, it would affect mobility, stamina, risk, moods, and so on. But the fact of the matter is that unforgiveness does this as well. And what, uh, there's a uh, quite a well-known study at Stanford, the Stanford Forgiveness Project, which is worth looking up. Uh, you can just Google Stanford Forgiveness Project and it'll lead you to quite a lot of information. The, this PhD at Stanford um, was, in the, was in the doctoral program when he realized that he, there was someone who had really wounded him and he just could not let it go. And he realized it was really affecting his life, so he decided he would use this subject for his PhD dissertation. As he got into it, he was absolutely astonished to see that when they uh, went through a process of a, of a subject group who were in a forgiving process, kind of a very structured uh, procedure to forgive people, versus a group that was not in that process, that there were quite a, some striking uh, results from that. The ones who, the baseline of where they started, the ones in the forgiving group, um, in terms of bitterness and resentment and how much they felt <coughs> wounds from other people, actually dropped 70% by the time they were through with this process. So that it's not that they said um, that they were unaware at the end that someone had done them, them a grave ill. Maybe it's that a parent abandoned them when they were five and they remembered this very clearly and it had left a wound and they did better their whole lives. Well, it's not that at the end of the forgiveness process they were, it was as, as if that's peachy. No, it isn't peachy. But they could remember it without feeling the, the wound so much. Um, anger reduction was a big outcome. And uh, more optimism and greater ability to cope with various issues. So, the, so just in terms of science, it's a smart thing to do. And I'm just trying to get this, uh, the advanced work. Uh, they, furthermore, they discovered that the immune system got a boost, that ver uh, other aspects of physiological reactivity, you know how sometimes if something happens that really gets on your nerves, you can feel it in your body. Well, when they were through with the forgiving process, that wasn't as true. It's almost as if you develop sort of this inner Teflon that things can happen that are offensive and that under normal circumstances you'd find really, uh, would just really tick you off. But isn't it nice to be able to, to have an inner response that isn't so controlled by the other person? Why do we let other people commandeer our interior? Why do we let other people commandeer our personalities? by l letting them get on our nerves so much that we're controlled by what they do or don't do. So additional uh, outcomes, the people who went through a forgiving process ended up with lower blood pressure, with a, a more moderated steady uh, heart rate, and, um, and other aspects of physical advantages. Um, now, the other, th the other things uh, are benefits as well. So, why do you think, give me some uh, thoughts, some of your thoughts on this. Why do you think if I'm going around in a stew because I'm just so angry at someone who really did do me great damage? Let's say someone lied about me and I lost a job and I've been unemployed for a whole year all because of that and it's because they wanted that job. So, it's, it's not that, I, that there's not a legitimate beef, but um, if I can get to the point where I let it go and forgive that person, um, there are a lot of benefits which are not just physiological. If, as long as I'm in this place where I'm full of resentment, how do you think it affects other relationships? Not the person I'm mad at, other people. What effect does it have? You're not to be around. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, that's just part of it is that if I'm, if I'm just obsessing about this wound, if I'm walking around as this, uh, a big walking wound, I am, you know, if someone else sees me coming, they may just go the other way. Because, and they certainly don't want to be in my presence much, because it's kind of a pain. Now, maybe we should say we should have more compassion than that and go looking for people to hang out with. Uh, and uh, so, can, may I ask you, could we, we're gonna have time for questions at the oh, end, is great. that all right? Okay, great, I'm can, sorry. Would you, can, do you have would a little paper? Me? Do you have a little paper you can write down so you don't forget? 
your question? Um, so we have healthier relationship behaviors when we, we can let go of uh, bitterness. And that then opens a whole different world to us in terms of relationships. It also advances our spiritual life. Why? Give me some ideas why you think that might be. If I forgive, why is it likely to give me a boost in terms of my spiritual life? Peace. And also, you know, it's an act of obedience. It's a pretty clear biblical concept. And if even in the Lord's Prayer, the very prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, we are told to forgive that we may be forgiven. Obviously, there's a linkage between our willingness to forgive and so it's an act of obedience. We're conforming to the nature of God himself. We are allowing ourselves to be in, aligned with him. And, and yes, sometimes it can be painful to let it go, and we'll talk about that. But because it's obedient, because we are acting in obedience, it automatically opens up spiritual vitality that, that uh, is not really accessible otherwise. So think about unforgiveness behaviors. And this is why the health can really take a hit. We tend to, internally, we tend to ruminate, think about it over and over. We tend to, uh, then that builds up resentment, maybe contempt for the other person. It also feeds into anxiety. The more we're just a bundle of negative thinking, uh, the more anxiety is gonna kick in. The, the, what we know from science is that the mind controls emotions. What we do in our minds actually is the engine of emotions. So, and that's why when it says in the New Testament, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will surround your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That, uh, you know, that really is now it's what scientists think is such a brilliant discovery. That, that, and it's actually called thought stopping and thought substitution that if I am thinking about something that is very negative, a wound, a disappointment, a fear, um, it, and, and I know that this is taking me down, I can, I can, I can choose to stop, but it, that's not going to last very long if I don't substitute uh, thoughts. So I can choose to start thinking about, I'll tell you a great one and we'll see in a minute why, is to stop and say, what is it I should be grateful for? Yes, I just lost that opportunity, but I have a roof over my head, I have food, I have friends, I have family who loves me, I'm really actually pretty fortunate. To stop and just uh, focus on the things we're grateful for and, and something that went well today or this week instead of the thing that went poorly, and we find ourselves in a different place. But if we're full of resentment and bitterness, that's not what happens, and so our interior becomes dark. When our interior becomes dark, what happens externally? Give me some ideas. What happens if that's what we're carrying around inside? How do, how do other people experience us? You push people away. Nobody wants to be around you. Nobody wants to be around a victim or somebody who's... Right. If we're, if, if we're negative, angry, critical, um, and, don't, and all of us have encountered people like this, that I, I actually, years ago um, at a... Um, on holidays, we'd go to my husband's, um, there were three of his aunts in Iowa who never married, and they, boy, did they make a feast on holidays. So we'd, all of the, their nieces and nephews and the ones who married them would, uh, cat, would uh, come to their house on holidays and they would have a feast, but there was one uh, aunt, they're, they're no longer alive, the, there was one aunt in the batch who was not, she was not one of those. She was a, from a different side of the family. And people learned not to say, how are you? <laughs> because, uh, and I remember once my brother-in-law said, well, how are you? And said her name. And he said, oh, oh no, you can only tell me the good stuff. So he caught it fast. But that's because you would get an hour-long discussion on kidney, liver, on every organ in the body and everything in the world that could possibly be. And so people actually took turns sitting next to her because if you did it one holiday, someone else should be the one the next. Now we really don't want to be that person, do we? That the whole family plans to rotate, that they're gonna sit next to you because it's so depressing. So that's kind of what happens. If we let our interior become so dark, then it affects our, the, our exterior as well. So unforgiveness looks like this. 
like it affects our physiology, our immune system. It, it fills a, us with anxiety and depression and other negative um, moods that become very toxic, not just to ourselves, to other people. And, um, and it ends up driving other people away from us. So we're, um, we're going to look at spiritual factors related to this, but I want to just ask you if for some examples of, and especially if they're kind of public examples that other people would immediately imagine if you just give the example. Can you think of an example of forgiveness that was just pretty amazing? Right, okay, so that when the Pope, uh, John Paul, was shot and went to the prison and forgave this man who shot him. What's another example? So in, in the Amish community, when that shooter went into the school and shot all those children and was this not just astonishing, um, and the Amish actually uh, reached out to the wife of the shooter and <laughs> took care of her took her food and looked out for her. Is this not just amazing? And, and if you wanted an example of the love of God, is this in, in skin? Didn't the Amish come through? What can you think of an example that's more recent? People in South Carolina. Absolutely, Charleston. I mean, this was stunning. It was absolutely stunning that when someone came with an, with an evil heart to cause destruction and death, that they would, as a group, I, I, honestly, it was breathtaking because um, how, what a powerful message in terms of the of spiritual force within our lives that defies human ability to function in healthy ways. And uh, so it, now I'll give you a couple of other examples. Um, one of the things that I have found striking is our court cases where somebody is on trial for horrendous murders. And sometimes, you know, it may be a serial killer who, who has killed quite a few people. And there have been several cases that I've observed w when the following would happen. You know, a lot of the relatives of victims will show up and give uh, speeches about how they hate this, you know, I hate you. Even, I hope you rot in hell. I hope you burn in hell. I always cringe when I hear them say these kinds of things, which I think is really God's business. But, at any, but on the other hand, we can understand why they might feel this way. And every so often, there will be someone who will get up and say, looking directly at the, at the murderer, I want you to know, know something. My faith teaches me to respond to you in a very different way. I forgive you. And more than once, I've seen somebody who is, who's on trial for these horrendous things who has been sitting there so stoically, not flinching, not even responding at all, as they're the target of all the hatred, melt like that when someone aims love and forgiveness at them. It's, a very, it's so powerful. So um, in scripture, what it says, however, in Matthew is that we forgive to invite God's forgiveness of ourselves. So, um, Yes, the person that we're forgiving is getting an act of mercy. Maybe they deserve something quite different, humanly speaking. But we're choosing because we are um, responding to God's love for us and to his challenge to us to conform to his nature, not our, our own, to forgive. And what scripture says is you're doing yourself a big favor, that really the gift is to yourself because you're, you're partly because you're eliminating this toxin from your own interior. It even says in Matthew that, that we should not just forgive, but even love our enemies. Now that's a tough one. But the, in South Carolina, the Amish, these are examples of the Pope of actually doing just that. And in Romans, it actually says that we should make our forgiveness practical and even reach out and with a hand up to the very people who have been offensive and who have wounded us. Can you imagine how transforming that would be in this country? And I often think that if the, if the church community, broadly speaking, actually lived this in a powerful way, that just the church community alone could be this huge infusion of a whole different character and nature in this country. 
So um, now I'd like to hear your views on if you were going to define forgiveness, what would you say? If you were going to say, this is what it means to forgive, what would you say? To love when, they, when neither person deserves it. Okay, to love when somebody doesn't really deserve it? Yeah, neither of us deserve it. And that's true, that we're, we're undeserving and as well as the other person. What else does forgiveness mean? If I forgive somebody... What am I doing? Maybe yes, back here. Right, an understanding that maybe the hurt that you did the harm. Tommy has a past that was that was not necessarily in control. Now I see this clinically a lot. What he's saying is that. Sometimes the person who is the wounder uh, may, may have their own issues that make it, make it very difficult for them to be in control. Um, I just have to tell you that very often in a clinical situation, I encounter people who walk in the door and tell pretty horrific stories about not just, just how they have wounded other people, but how they also have been wounded. When I get the history and, and hear what the childhood was like and what, what experiences they've had, Sometimes the miracle is that they function as well as they do. And so this is a very good point, and that is that sometimes when we understand more about the story of the wounder, we may, it doesn't mean we think, oh, that's okay, but, um, but it puts a different spin on it. If you make a point from this point on, I mean, let's hope there aren't any, but let's put it this way, in the past, when we've had some of these shootings, and especially young people, being the shooters, I just kind of wait to see what the story is. Because so often, not always, and I don't want to malign uh, situations where parents have been about as amazing as is possible to be, and yet these things happen. But so often, it's a child in a home where there's been a lot of brokenness, maybe abuse, abandonment, maybe a lot worse. and. There is something very corrosive. We're not doing a brain study tonight, but we know that the family has a huge effect on the, on the very nature of the brain, on the physiology of the brain. I mean, we're kind of born with, we're born with as many uh, neurological connections in the brain as there are stars in the Milky Way, but really it's just the hardware. It's the family mostly that inputs the software and, and has such a huge, impact on the development of the brain and especially the the um, the social brain the part of the brain that affects relationship empathy um, compassion communication ability and by that they really are talking about the ability to communicate in a way that achieves the objective not just talking but actually to to achieve um, an understanding at the other end that we're that we're seeking um, emotional control, a whole range of components that go into the social brain that are primarily the, the effect of the family. And just a little caveat on that is I, that everyone in this room, if we all have this view, what a difference it can make. And that is that I used to think whenever my kids, they're grown now, 29 and son and 23-year-old daughter, but when they used to bring friends home from school, I used to assume that some of those kids were coming from heartache that I would never know. They might look perfectly normal and happy-go-lucky, but I just know what the odds are that out of every 10 kids, X number of them is, is, is carrying a big burden from things that happen that they would never want anyone to see in terms of maybe the warfare between the parents or warfare between parents and kids. And, and I would, so I would always assume my opportunity here is to be a safe refuge. I don't need to know personal information, but what I can do is make this house a place where they can come, feel safe emotionally, talk to me if they want to, don't talk to me if they don't want to, have a good time. And what, interestingly, when my kids were in college, some of their buddies would call up and say, are you gonna be home tomorrow? I'd like to come see you. They'd come hang out with me, even if my kids weren't around. And so um, we, we are brain agents too. Everyone in this room is somewhat of a, of a uh, neurosurgeon. And that is that every experience we have actually alters the brain. So when we become a safe place, a safe experience for other people, then we're helping them get 
to a, a better place in terms of even their ability to function health, in a healthy way. Okay. Yes. How do you forgive for giving a debt? I'm sorry? For giving a debt. For giving a debt. A debt like either a money debt or some other kind of debt, a financial debt or some other debt. Yes, that would be, that would be a form of forgiveness as well. Now, well, forgiveness is the will, is the ability or the willingness to abandon resentment or the right of resentment and the, or the right to revenge. It's not pardoning, condoning, excusing or forgetting or denying or even reconciliation. So if you were, if you were going to say, here's the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation, how would you describe the difference? If I forgive someone, does it, does it guarantee that I'm, I'm going to be reconciled with them? Okay, so someone says no. Let me hear from this crowd over here. You're kind of quiet. So um, wh why, if I forgive someone, would, would it be possible that there would not be reconciliation? Well, they might not even know that she's That's true. They might not know, and it may not be something that's actually helpful. I mean, if you walk up to somebody who never knew you, uh, you resented them, and you say, you know, I hated you for years, and now I'm over it. I forgive you. Well, that's a real, that's a real gift, isn't it? But you were going to say something. I can choose to not have them in my life. I can let go of the resentment, if you will, or the anger, but I can just, you know, not have it part of my circle. Right, and then we have to think about why, what's going on if we choose that, and you were going to say something. Right, so we can control forgiving. The other person may not want to reconcile, and it doesn't look very forgiving if we say, listen, you, you, you better have a relationship with me because I forgave you. That doesn't look very forgiving, does it? It makes it look as if there's an agenda. Um, are there biblical concepts that would say, be careful about reconciliation? Can you think of any? Sometimes people use the verse, you know, tr uh, turn the cheek, Seven, when someone strikes you, turn the cheek 70 times as if you should just put up with everything. Are there biblical concepts that would suggest that's not really accurate? Yes? You know, I've often thought about that particular verse, and it's in clear context to read the paragraph, the sentence before it. It's what should I do if my brother comes and seeks forgiveness? So, isn't that a prerequisite? It's a very good point, isn't it? He's saying the business about turning the cheek 70 times, the, the preceding verses say, what should I do if my brother comes and seeks forgiveness? And then it says, well, if that, because that says something about the mentality of the person. And, and, but I want to give you some other verses. If you look up verses on, on, uh, on foolish people, on evil, on wicked people, what you'll discover is that the, biblically, what God says is be careful. Be careful who you hang out with. Be careful who you absorb into your life. It says, for example, in Proverbs, go not with an angry man, lest you become like him. God is the one who says emotions are contagious. Be careful. Now, some of you have relatives who are like this. I'm sure there are people in this room who have relatives who would fit into certainly the foolish category and maybe the evil or wicked category who, go, who actually intentionally are destructive and out to draw blood with innocent people. So it's, it doesn't mean necessarily that we just amputate ourselves from someone who's a relative who has that nature. But, but I think of it this way, that, um, that it's like, how do you love a black widow spider? Very carefully, very carefully. And, and biblically, you know, we would have uh, guidance on that, in fact, that we don't, it doesn't mean we have to be a bosom buddy with someone who is chronically destructive just because we forgive them. It's one thing to forgive, it's another thing. You know, like that shooter of the Pope, let's say they would let him out of prison and he went and shot somebody else. You know, I don't think too many of us would say, would you like to have lunch tomorrow? I mean, um, you, know, and let, you know, sometimes these things happen and people feel that God is leading them to put themselves in a very risky uh, situation. But we have to be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. We have to use some good judgment and seek God's, uh, God's guidance on these things. Um, so I'm going to show you some, uh, and I'm sorry that some of these slides look a little uh, lopsided. It's because that's what happens when I put them on a thumb drive. 
you know, they start out pretty good and then they don't always align. But, it, but there's a great book that the diocese uses uh, a lot called Unbound by Neil Lozano. It has a great section on forgiveness. And I want to just sort of walk through some of these uh, steps. And I recommend the book. It's great. So step number one in his sequence, and then there's sort of a, a high-powered sequence that follows these six steps. Step one, he suggests to invite a spiritually mature person to kind of walk with you and that you can confide in and feel safe. So what, what uh, kind of person is it safe to confide in? Priest. A priest, that would, that would be a good place to start. Um, maybe I'm gonna turn this question around. What kind of person would be unsafe to confide in? I'm sorry? A what? Oh, I'm sorry. A gossip, absolutely. That's at the top of the list, isn't it? I mean, you don't want to confide something very private and sensitive to someone who's going to blab it all over like a radio station. So it needs to be someone who has good judgment. They fall into the wise category. That's another good little Bible study to look up everything you can find on wise people and how they function. And one is that they control their, ma their speech and they, don't, and they are uh, careful with the reputations of other people. So... So if there, and then the other thing is, uh, you know, how much, if you're going to confide in someone, how much wisdom do they have in that particular area, if you're actually looking for input? And I think about people who maybe have marriage problems and they go complain to their two best friends who have been through four marriages. Well, probably that's not going to be a great, a fount of wisdom, you know, or, uh, or confide about their money problems to someone who's bank, been bankrupt four times. You know, one, we have to use our, our good sense a little bit in terms of confiding. But what Lozano is saying is you should choose someone who's spiritually mature, so that's a big caveat, to confide in about a forgiveness process and see if they'll kind of walk the journey with you. Step number two is to praise God. Start there instead of focusing on the person who's wounded you. Now let me show you some amazing data uh, about... Um, praise and thanksgiving. So, um, and, you, and your handouts have all of this information. If you don't have them, there are more um, around. Here, okay, so here, if, can you see if there's anyone else who doesn't oh, have fine. some? And, yeah, okay. Sure. Um, so, um, what, now this is uh, actually research from, from Harvard, among other places, but it's interesting how when the scientists start studying this, they think it's such a brilliant uh, discovery. But of course, all of this was in scripture, you know, how many millennia? And uh, so now the scientists uh, are excited to discover these things, but it's useful to see the research that if we get in, and by the way, the uh, daily gratitude habit is particularly potent. So I encourage clients who come and are struggling with anxiety, depression, all kinds of things to start right away when you wake up in the morning, maybe before you even get out of bed, just lay there for a few minutes and make and and be thankful for at least three things. If they're people of faith, most of the people I see are, then I'll say, you know, just say a little prayer and thank God and you can't cheat and make it the same three things every day. Every day try to wake up and thank God for three things that you haven't thought about for the last week and start there. Now what's interesting is by the time their feet hit the floor, they're already in a different frame of mind because they realize that everything isn't so bleak. I'll tell you one little story. Um, my son was, I guess, in the second grade. One day I went and picked him up at school and he gets in the car and he's clearly in a funk. And I, and I, and I, I say, well, Joseph, um, what, how are you? Or how was your day? Well, it was awful. Why was it awful? Everybody was mean. So, oh, well, that's really sad. So who was mean? Well, Sally was mean. She gave everybody candy but me. Oh, well, that, do that doesn't sound too nice. And Andrew was mean. He tripped me on the playground. Oh, well, that doesn't sound nice either. And, and Sammy, you know, he said something really mean to me. Oh, well, that doesn't sound too nice. And so who else was mean? He thinks, well, I can't think of anybody else. Oh, okay. So how many are in your class? 20. And so that's three people were mean. And then there's you. That's four. So how many are left? 16. So are you saying that 16 people were not mean? 
Yeah, that's true. 16 people were not. I mean, oh, well, that's a pretty good deal. I thought this was pretty sad if all 20 were, or all 19 except you were mean to you. This is, this is a lot better that 16 were, were okay. You know what? I'm watching his face in the rear view mirror and he just lights up because his thought had changed. He was thinking everybody had been mean. <laughs> now he discovers that 16 had been pretty nice. Now, it seems like a very simple example. The fact of the matter is we're the same. If we focus on the three that, that have given us a kick, uh, you know, in the head in the last 10 years or, the, or in our family or whatever, and don't focus on all those who didn't do that, in fact, maybe were even really nice, no wonder where we go around uh, in a, in, with everything being so bleak. At any rate, when we pause for gratitude on a daily basis, here's what happens. We get better sleep, both in quantity and quality. We have a more positive affect. So um, when we go around and our face actually looks somewhat cheerful, at least not so dreary, what effect does it have on other people? It's contagious. It is contagious, and it invites a positive response. Um, what it, and then you can see my age. I need my glasses here. Yes. Right. And, but then you may have 16 others who are observing, and 16 others who may not have the courage to say something and interject, or redirect the focus to something that's more constructive. So those 16 other people who may not have courage, are they or are they not part of the group? Well, so then that's a whole other subject, but what she's saying, I'm repeating this for the tape, is that the 16 people are, look as if they're passive, but are they really passive because their silence is a contributor and that's, that there's a point to that. And one, and so I'll just make a, a point about that, which is these are, these are good opportunities, whether it's for ourselves or, or with a friend or with a child to say, so if you saw someone treated this way, what do you think you should do? To help them see that you know they're part of the chemistry of what's going to happen and what the impact is going to be on that person. But in terms of what the daily gratitude impact, um, in addition to this, actually what's interesting is if I get into a daily pattern of uh, gratitude, I'm I'm likely to get more exercise. Even now, doesn't that seem kind of like an odd outcome? Why do you think that would be? I'm sorry. Have more energy. I mean, you know, if you're feeling so depressed, who wants to go run? You should, that's when we should, because that also is a, is a mood booster. But, um, and in terms of altruism, we're more likely to reach out and do kind things, and it's for the same reason, there was water in our own well. When we're feeling sorry for ourselves and feel so grim, you know, we just don't even have the energy, and sometimes I think are not even likely to notice someone else who's down. But when, we're, when we are getting into a gratitude habit, our mood lifts, we're more likely to reach out with kindness to someone else. And um, so now, interestingly, if you look on this, uh, on this slide, on the next column over, and I'm seeing if this little pointer, uh, we also become somewhat of a kindness magnet. Now, why would that be? Why do, why do we attract kindness? And this is research. This is what the research says. We realize Jesus loves us <laughs> and we love them. Well, when we're functioning with a, in a, with a brighter affect, when we're reaching out to other people to be kind, obviously they're going to feel more likely to be kind to us. So if we, if, it's just interesting how powerful this is. And, of course, more spiritually aware and, and have a higher level ability to cope. So if you, in your handouts, these are some, article, the, some links that you may you may want to Google, and this is uh, University of California r Research on Gratitude, um, Stanford Research on Gratitude, The Gift That Keeps on Giving, says Stanford, and In Praise of Gratitude is the Harvard Mental Health Letter. And it's all about the amazing impact of gratitude in our lives physiologically, emotionally, and socially. So when, when it comes to scripture, a few thoughts. Um, Top-down tips right from, right from the top on, um, on gratitude. In Philippians, it says, When anxious, pray and give thanks. 
and the peace of God beyond comprehension will inoculate your heart. Okay, well, it's a little paraphrase. Inoculate. That's not really. That's my paraphrase. Inoculate your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6-8. Proverbs. As we think, so we are. That how, whatever's going on up here is what's going to cascade through our body, our physiology, and, and from that out to relationship. And Romans 12, 1 and 2. Literally, we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. What we choose to do in our minds is, is, is transformative, for good or ill. So, next step when it comes to Lozano is to that if we get to this point of gratitude, and <clears throat> which is really also an act of obedience, um, what often happens then is that we're in a better place to really sense the Holy Spirit. And we should really ask for God to help us sense what the Holy Spirit is saying to us in terms of moving on in, this, in an act of forgiveness and, and seeking to yield our own will, yield our resistance, this can be painful. Why can't it be painful to get to the point of forgiving somebody? What's painful about it? Being around them or just thinking about forgiving. terrible stuff? Okay, so thinking about the terrible stuff they've done or being around them and sometimes you almost feel Seems we're, we're more forgiving when we're not around them. <laughs> that can be. But I, I'm sorry? You have to let go. You have to let go because sometimes it almost feels like you are um, allowing yourself to be, um, you're trying to hold on to it because after all you mattered more than that and you shouldn't have been treated like this. So it almost can feel like if I let it go, it's like I'm saying I deserved it and I'm not worthy of being treated more th better than this. But that's really, that's, that's not accurate. We're not, we are worthy. We shouldn't be treated Ill, illy. And so we have to not uh, allow untruth from the other side to control our responses. And, you know, I've certainly been in the situation where I think, oh my goodness, this is hard to let go. But I know that I'm the loser if I don't do that. So I want to move ahead here because I can see that clock. It's just ticking right away. Um, so um, step four is to gain perspective through Jesus' words. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That very often, and someone else has already said this, that our offenders may be themselves uh, in a bad place, maybe they've been treated so horribly that they think they're treating, treating us well. Now that is actually true. People who grow up in situations where they're battered around. I remember one young woman who was a client in college telling me that, actually this was after college, and she told me once in college she went home with someone and she was shocked that in the, during the entire weekend no one in the family got thrown into a wall. Because she'd never, in her home, there would not have been a weekend that, where no one was thrown into a wall. If that's the way you grow up, and you just speak nasty to someone, you think you're, that's pretty good. Because you're used to people getting thrown into a wall. Do you see what I'm saying? So sometimes a person who treats us illy or is rude or something, by, based on what they've experienced, they don't even have a clue what just happened. And so it can help just to put that in perspective. Um, and, Focus on the specific pain inflicted on us and, um, and really seek God's help in, in getting past that. And I'm going to move on quickly here to number five because I want to I give you an example. And at the end, we thank God for his goodness and for his direction and seek ways to love others in practical ways. Now, I'm going to tell you about the, the, the next section in Lozano's book and, I'm gonna, and my own experience. So um, I suppose it was a year and a half ago. Someone in the diocese said, I knew they were using this book pretty widely, and I, so I had, got a copy, and I got to the section on, on forgiveness. And I'd never have been, I've never really struggled with forgiveness, so I just thought, well, let me read it and you know, see what he's saying, because I study it quite a bit because of a lot of clients who struggle with the, these issues. So I get to this part where he's talking about kind of a more intense um, approach to um, forgiveness. And, he, and, he, and um, so I stop and I say to myself, is there anyone I haven't forgiven? And the answer immediately is, no, there's no one I have not forgiven. And then the, a name just 
kind of smacks into my mind, and I think to myself, well, it was someone who, when we were children, did a lot of very destructive things in, to uh, kids in my family. And, um, but I had not struggled with resentment, and Anne had, in fact, done a lot of kind things for that person. So when that name came to me, I thought, oh, well, that's not true. But it wouldn't go away. So then I think, hmm, something's up here. And I thought, I think that this is the Holy Spirit telling me something. Now, I don't even understand this because I don't feel resentment toward this person. And so then as I went deeper into this passage in Lozano's book, Unbound is the title of it, um, and he, he talked about renouncing the kind of breaking the wound down into parts and renouncing each of those parts. So it would go something like this. Like, what were the wounds this person, how did they wound? And what was behind those wounds? Well, they could be really, really vicious psychologically and emotionally. So, uh, so I pause and I think, okay, I renounce emotional brutality, emotional abuse. I renounce that in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of his blood. And what you're really doing is speaking the name of the evil behavior and renouncing it, acknowledging its sin. And interestingly, part of what Lozano talks about is that, that these behaviors that target us can almost leave little seeds. If not, it's not necessarily that we repeat that same behavior. It may be that we repeat it, or it may be that it just sort of is the seed of, of bitterness that, um, may, that grows in ways that can be very destructive. Okay, so I said, okay, I renounce emotional abuse. What else? I renounce hatefulness. That certainly was true. I renounce physical abuse, which happened. I renounce um, gossip. Oh, that was a big load. Um, and then I just, I, I just sat there and let myself be open to the Holy Spirit and asking him, what else, what else? And I, as much as I could kind of pry apart, went through this little process of, of renouncing. Now, what's interesting is when the name came to my head and I first tried to brush it away and then it wouldn't go away, so I thought, oh my goodness, I think this is the Holy Spirit. At that point, I decided, well, then I'm going to obey. And out loud, I was in my kitchen all by myself, out loud, I said the name, and I said, I forgive. At that moment, I felt sort of this burden just sort of fall away. I was amazed, because I didn't even think I had a problem with this. And, um, and, and then, when I went through this renouncing process of these sort of underlying issues, the same thing happened. It was as if the, there were just sort of waves of, of um, you know, I just felt internally there was a shift. Interestingly, since that point, and this has been about a year and a half ago, I, my radar has been on higher gear for uh, forgiveness because I, I, do, I don't tend to be a person who resents things, but I'll tell you one thing. There are people that if I see them, I get heartburned. <laughs> you know, I kind of feel like, oh, brother, I dread seeing this person. And, and so then I have to stop and say, what's that about? It may not be that I want them to, you know, trip and fall or fall off a bridge. It may not be that I'm just uh, loaded with resentment for them, but maybe they've done things that just have been uncomfortable enough that I think, oh my goodness, uh, you know, this person is just kind of a pain. So I've been working on, on, you know, that kind of stuff in terms of, because if it may be, in fact, that God wants to use me and that person's life in a positive and healing way. And if I avoid them like the plague, that's just not likely now, is it? Now, I'm not saying, once again, go back to the point made about we don't have to be a bosom buddy. I don't, I pray about these things. And, and you know, sometimes I've sensed God saying to me, yes, you should be more open and, in fact, reach out to this person. And sometimes I feel like he's saying, I, would you just make sure you're clean as a whistle in terms of your attitude? But I don't feel like he's saying you need to reach out and try to uh, connect in a tighter way. But um, it's... And I can tell you that in terms of either people I've encountered in just my walk in life or in clinical situations, there's something very, very powerful about forgiveness. And um, I'm thinking of someone who works in houses in this area, 
and who was abused as a child sexually from a very young age by her father. And when he was dying, she hadn't seen him for 27 years, he lives in another country. When he was dying, he sent a message through cousins that he wanted her forgiveness. She called him and he wept and said he, was, he, he, he wanted forgiveness for taking her jewelry. And she said, you know, I don't really care about that, but, but what you did to my mind and my body was an issue, but I forgave you long ago because I don't want that poison in me. And she, and she then, uh, she came to me and she said, uh, you know, I forgave him, but I don't feel warm and fuzzy. And I said, you know what, You've, there are two aspects of forgiveness. One is an act of the will where we choose to obey what God has said. The other part of it is the emotional peace, which may not come immediately. As she prayed for him, as he was dying, and got the relatives in that other country to go visit him, they all hated him because he'd been so nasty to everybody. Um, he was really transformed in the process. And when he died, his sister, who was elderly, called weeping and said to this woman, uh, thank you so much because you sent my brother to God clean and white. It was quite an amazing story. And, and she said that at the beginning of this process, she still had nightmares of her father chasing her with a butcher knife. By the end, she would have these dreams of him as this frail little man. She would walk up and wrap him in her arms and hold him. What, a, what an amazing shift, even in dream life, as she went through this forgiving process. Now, we have, we have a, a, just not long, but a few minutes for just a little discussion. Well, that's true. Uh, and, and, I, and one observation is a lot of it goes back to family. I, I do a lot of research on generational, uh, a generational perspective. on, uh, And so I'll just tell you that, you know, um, M Moses said, confess the sins of your fathers. I, my translation is confess the sins of your ancestors. That includes mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers. So confess the sins of your ancestors and God will restore his covenant with your family, is what Moses said. Now that's Leviticus 26, 40 through 45. What Murray Bowen at Georgetown University discovered was that people who work on the family of origin issues make remarkably fast progress emotionally and relationally and even often make faster progress in their marriages than people in marriage counseling. So you got that? That if I were having problems in my marriage, it actually would probably be a faster route to, pro to healing in my marriage if I would focus on the issues in my family of origin, my old resentments, understanding the habits of my family of origin emotionally, relationally, spiritually, behaviorally, understanding those factors, what impact they, they had on me, and deal with it even if everybody's dead. If I deal with it in my heart, it's like this huge release and a lot of that is about forgiveness. That I will make faster progress in my marriage than if I go run off to some marriage counselor. Thing is, there's been a lot of trauma in the country, wave after wave of trauma. Um, if you look at a lot of the uh, obvious sources of those traumas and you look at the family life, even let's say with John Kennedy and the man who killed him, what a horrific family life he came from. So, so much of it does go back to what we do in our families. And if we came from families which were very wounding, uh, there's a fair chance we're going to do the same and repeat it generation after generation unless we deal with it. So that's a whole other discussion. But, it's, but this is, forgiveness is a very powerful thing to start with right at home. And if everyone in this room went home and thought about, you know, what is it that I carry around as a wound from my mother? What is a wound I carry around from my father? Those, you know what? Those very likely are the very sins that Moses is talking about when he says, confess the sins of your fathers. And, um, and then it says also in, uh, in other parts of the Old Testament, it especially focuses on this as well. So we can start right in the family tree, make pretty amazing and fast progress and move out from there. And, and as for the nation, if we would actually do this healing in our own families, and because the family is the engine of the culture. And what we know is that in families that do have stability, the children then as adults are much, much more likely to have stable emotional life, stable financial life, economic life, 
stable marriages, and, and if we start in our generation to do as well as we can, and even if there have been wounds in our generation, to try, start now, today, of seeking God, seeking forgiveness for the wounds we feel, and by the way, you know, going to people we've wounded, and being an agent of healing by, by confessing our own wounding behavior and asking for forgiveness from them. And then we can't guarantee what their response will be, what we've done, what we need to do. And one more that, and I'm repeating it just for the, that, um, that not forgiving it feels risky because what if they do it again? But you know, and I'm trying to think of a specific, um, well actually Joseph is a pretty good example in the Old Testament. His brothers were human traffickers and almost homicidal. You know, they first were going to kill him and because he was the favorite son and uh, then decided, oh well, we'll just sell him into slavery. So off he goes to Egypt. And he suffered there, was thrown into prison and some of the other prisoners were, ex were killed and now he, he doesn't know if it's going to, he's next. Then he ends up uh, rising in the ranks to be really prime minister of Egypt. So when his brothers show up because of a famine, they don't recognize him. He has changed a lot, but he recognizes them. It's very interesting, uh, several things. One is, before we get to that scene, it says in Genesis that uh, Moses forgot his family. Now we know he didn't forget his family because when they showed up, he knew exactly where, who they were. What I think it implies is that he did sit around uh, mulling over what all they had done to him after all, he ends up in this foreign country and, and is in jail and so on and suffers. But as he began to see God's plan for him, which really was built on what these brothers had done, he begins to get a different perspective about what's up. That, well, this is pretty amazing. Here I am, prime minister. And, and so he quit thinking about his family. Then they show up. Now, he didn't just immediately say, oh, well, brothers, it's all over. No, 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 he didn't. And I would ask for questions only, we have to, it's, we're a little over here. Um, what did he do? He said to the brothers, okay, we'll give you grain, but he sneaked a, this fancy mug and in, in, goblet into his full brother's uh, sack, sent them on their way, and then he send, sent his agents after them to, to search their bags to see who had st stolen the goblet knowing that it was a setup. He was, he was gonna watch for their response. What happened was that the brothers come back, they're horrified because this is the full brother of the brother they had, they had sold. Their father was still alive but still back home. They were horrified that if they went home with, with the second brother of that favorite mom, that favorite wife, he, had, he was a polygamist, if, he, if they went home without him, that would be it for the father. And so, um, so the brothers, now this is interesting because it revealed there had been a big change. The brothers begged Joseph and said, put us in jail. You can't keep him. It'll just kill our father. Let him go. Keep us. Wow, what a turnaround. At that point, uh, let's say the room was this size. I'm sure it was ten, you know, five times this size. But let's say the room in the palace where Joseph was as the prime minister of Egypt was this size. He told all of the Egyptians to get out, get out, get out. When they were outside the doors with the door shut, he's only with his brothers, it says he wailed so loud. You could hear him far beyond those doors. He, got, he was full of emotion seeing these brothers and he said, don't you recognize me, I am Joseph. They were terrified because they thought after what we did to him, look out. He said to them, you meant it for evil but God meant it for good. And this is a wonderful example to meditate on. It has so many wonderful elements. And one of them is that Joseph was able to see the sovereignty of God in, in what had transpired. And because he was open to that, God was able to use him in amazing ways. And isn't it interesting that the victim of the hatefulness was the one who rescued his wounders?